Good evening. Good evening. My name is Colleen Kennedy, and I am Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Catholic Theological Union. On behalf of Father Mark Francis, who sadly uh, has broken his shoulder, uh, he is recovering well, uh, but I welcome you to CTU. Thank you for joining us tonight, uh, for honoring the work of John Carr, and for featuring the lecture of Brian Flanagan. As CTU celebrates our 50th anniversary, we also approach the 10th anniversary of CTU as the home of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative where it is an integral part of the Bernadin Center. I'm very grateful to the director of the Bernadin Center, Steve Millies, and to the members of the CCGI National Advisory Committee who are here this evening for the important work they offer toward the future of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. As Father Tom Nairn, an honoree, told us last September, we are in the midst of what is, quote, not simply a philosophical or even a theological debate, but rather a debate about the life and the future of the church, end quote. Dialogue in a humble church, indeed. CCGI is adapting to the new realities of this polarized time and the new technologies that have connected our world, while at the same time that have the potential for deepening our divisions. As we look ahead, we see the work of Catholic Common Ground Initiative as a haven for critical dialogue and we are at work to establish a more vibrant presence for CCGI, both digitally and literally. The leadership that CCGI can provide to the world and to the church has never been more necessary. Again, thank you for being here tonight and welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I now would like to introduce Father Michael Place, the chair of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative Advisory Board. Thank you, Colleen, and on behalf of the Advisory Board Committee, our thanks to CTU for the partnership we've had for these 10 years, and we very much look forward to the years in front of us. And please extend to Mark our prayers and, and, and best wishes. We miss him. So on behalf of the committee, I, it is my privilege to welcome all of you tonight. Uh, as I do so, I do want to acknowledge the photo over here. Uh, that is Cardinal Bernadine and Monsignor Phil Murnian. While Cardinal Bernadine was the public face and in many ways an inspiration for the Catholic Go Common Ground Initiative, uh, Monsignor Murnian was the, if to use a uh, sort of a impolite descriptor of the workhorse, uh, that made it happen. And uh, the photo is from the first meeting of the common, was then the Catholic Common Ground Project of, it, of the advisory committee at the Sheridan, uh, downtown Chicago. And this was late September, early October, it was probably early, no, early October. And it was the Cardinal's last public appearance. Um, his doctors had suggested that he not come, but this was a piece of his ministry which he held so, so very deeply. So in that context of two great church persons, uh, we welcome you to this evening. We look forward to our grounding our evening in prayer because the heart and soul of the Common Ground Initiative is that it is a spirituality that is grounded in the Lord Jesus and the power of God's loving spirit. So we will gather in prayer and then we will proceed to the business of the night. 
gentle shepherd, in times of trouble, you comfort and guide us. Grant us strength amidst times of hardship, patience and prudence when we face <coughs> discouragement, and hope when all we feel is despair. For we know that with you, all things are possible. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again, the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor and our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety, whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that all the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. 
commitment to dialogue and the res resolution of differences. We pray to the Lord. by the sexual abuse crisis may find comfort and healing through God's tender care. We pray to the Lord. That gospel justice may transform societies divided by racism and other forms of prejudice. We pray to the Lord. That all of God's children may be treated with dignity the unborn, the sick, the elderly, immigrants and refugees, and all living on the margins of society, we pray to the Lord. gathered here tonight may be emboldened by the examples of Cardinal Joseph Bernardine and Monsignor Philip Murnian to take seriously the task of creating a church abounding with love, mercy, and trust. We pray to the Lord. Thank you. 
first of all, thank you to David and our musicians who helped us raise our hearts and spirits in prayer. <laughs> to place our evening in context, uh, we are gathered as the people of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. And let me read the mission statement. The Catholic Common Ground Initiative, inspired by the call to be one in Christ, invites Catholics with differing views about critical issues in the church to engage in prayerful dialogue for the sake of building up the communion of the church. Over the years, one of the ways in which the initiative has moved that mission forward has been first to uh, launch the Monsignor Philip Murnian lecture and if you look inside the program, you see the uh, very distinguished list of people who have uh, presented the lecture. And the goal has been to stimulate intellectual curiosity about how we as a church can engage both the legacy of Cardinal Bernadine and the challenge of building common ground. While we started that in 99, uh, it was several years later, 2001, that the committee felt that another part of its responsibility was to raise up before the church those who are in fact models of what the spirit of Cardinal Bernadine and the Catholic Common Ground Initiative is about. And so the first part of our program tonight is the presentation of that award. Before I get to the uh, serious dimension of that, though, I, I must comment that our honoree, John, and I have a history. I'll leave your imagination to that. Uh, we both uh, had the privilege of being staff persons to Cardinal Bernadine. Uh, Bishop, oh, there's a senior moment, General Secretary, went to, tele, to Florida. Lynch, thank you, <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> Bishop Lynch used to remind the Cardinal, yeah, you think you look good, it takes 50 of us to make you look that good. <laughs> uh, and John uh, was one of those uh, who was part of that making the Cardinal uh, look good, and for me, uh, before I get into reading the uh, citation, it is a, a deep personal privilege, John, to be able to share this uh, with you tonight. Uh, at dinner, I said to him, well, I've got two versions of the citation, and uh, I can read one, or you can pay me to read the other. <laughs> and John's response was, I think I come up after you. So you're gonna get the better version. <laughs> if you folks could come up. John, please come forward. These are two Bernadine scholars. Steve, do you wanna introduce them? So, the 2019 Bernadine Award to John Carr. For more than 20 years, John Carr was director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He called it the most pompous title in Washington. <laughs> he told an interviewer once about being introduced to a woman who, hearing the title, told him, you need to do a better job. <laughs> John's mission to promote justice, peace, and human development was, and I would add, and is, an uphill battle. 
Yet he accepted the challenge with faith in the gospel and in the ability of the church to do good in the world. His work began at the bishop's conference at a time before the time when Monsignor Philip Murnian and Cardinal Bernadine were beginning to track down, track the growing polarization in the church. From the earliest days of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative and to, during two decades that followed, John was a leading voice proclaiming the message that Catholic social teaching finds no home on either side of the partisan divide. I quote, the most important word in Catholic social teaching is and, John once said. As Catholics, we believe in the inviability of human life and the inviability of human dignity, both in a way that no political party captures fully. Since his retirement from USCCB in 2013, John's faithful service has continued in new directions. First, as a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics, and then more recently, it's five years you were saying now, doesn't seem possible, he founded the Institute on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University, where he continues to stake out a firm middle for the church in the world, avoiding extremes on all issues to hold fast to a common ground marked by faith and faithfulness. Last September, John disclosed his own experience with clergy sexual abuse as a high school seminarian, not to draw attention to himself, but to stand in solidarity with other survivors and to focus tension, attention on the secrecy and silence that has enveloped and perpetuated this stain of sexual abuse to hurt so many people. John spoke out this past winter to say, and I quote, the patience of the people of God is exhausted with the Episcopal and clerical culture that puts itself first, close quote. John spoke not only for abuse survivors, but also about another important dimension, how the public voice of the church, quote, which needs to be heard on undocumented people, the unborn, the poor has been compromised, and that's a terrible cost." Close quote. Bringing his personal witness and long experience to bear on this moment in the church, John again reminds us that our faith is not finally in an institution or an idea, but in the living word that gives life and light to the world when we value and prize every created person loved by God. This brief account of John's life and work does not do justice to the many roles he has played or how well he has played them. Still, the most important roles for him remain husband, father, and grandfather, which animate his work to build up a church led by diverse lay people to be a light to the world. And so, the Catholic Common Ground Initiative echoes the words of a recent profile in the National Catholic Reporter which said that, and I quote, if there were a compass to mark for the true North, mark for the true North Catholic, John would be the setting. We are proud to present him with the 2019 Cardinal Joseph Bernadine Award. I'm glad I paid for the good, uh, <laughs> good one. Uh, just a few words of gratitude. Uh, 
mixed emotions uh, hearing that, uh, humbled and honored. Uh, when Michael called me to uh, tell me about this, my first response was, what happened to standards? <laughs> I mean, last year it was Sister Doris, and now this. Uh, it, it occurred to me, I work at the intersection of faith and public life, of Catholic social teaching and uh, politics, and uh, we're not where we want to be. Uh, the church is in crisis, the country's in chaos, the capital is completely dysfunctional, uh, so you're giving me an award? <laughs> As somebody said, you need to do a better job. I take from that, uh, we all need uh, to do a better job, and the task is more important than ever. Uh, I was very struck by the beautiful reading from Corinthians, because I, I don't feel entirely adequate, uh, or very adequate at all to this. And I love the line, when one suffers, all suffer. And when one is honored, all are honored. <coughs> And so on a night like this, I think of all my colleagues at the conference. I think of uh, my colleagues, dear friends in this room. I think of Cardinal Bernadine and Monsignor Phil Mernian. I think of the bishops I've worked with. Uh, I especially think of my family, my parents, uh, my wife Linda, my sisters and brothers. Uh, you didn't mention, thankfully, uh, I worked for President Carter at the White House Conference on Families, and someone found out I was attending the graduation party of my sister in Minnesota, and they picketed the graduation party. And uh, one of my uncles said, uh, well, Lisa, no one will ever forget your graduation party. <laughs> Uh, when I went to Harvard, how I ever ended up a fellow at Harvard, when we told our kids that we were going to Cambridge, my son Tim said, are we talking about the real Harvard? <laughs> uh, the director met me, and this is sort of the common ground, and he said, I've looked at you on the internet, and I know you're a nut. I just don't know if you're a left-wing nut or a right-wing nut, <laughs> uh, which sort of summarizes Catholic social thought pretty well. Uh, here in Corinthians, I'm reminded of Mark Shields' uh, uh, repeated questions, did the Corinthians ever write back? Uh, I leave it to Brian uh, to answer that. I'm so proud to be here on a night that Brian is going to address this topic. And I'm proud to receive this award because of who gives it the cause it celebrates, or the mission it advances, and the person it's named for. Uh, I set a table, uh, I'm going to come out tonight. Uh, I was uh, part of the Common Ground Initiative from the very beginning. And we didn't meet in fancy hotels like the Sheraton, we met in some dump near Reston. And uh, because I was working at the Bishop's Conference, I did this on my own time and I could not be public about it. And I just thought I'd be secret, and Cardinal Bernadine said, uh, you'll be a member in pectore. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant, but it sounded great. Uh, uh, I reread the document on the plane. I thought it was unfairly attacked then, and it is really relevant now every word of it, and we fought over some of those words. It's a call not just for civility, but principle. It's a call for faith. It's a call to remind us that we're one family and we ought to act like that. In our own small way, our initiative at Georgetown tries to continue that work. Uh, principled civil dialogue. There's a hunger for what we're doing. We've had thousands of people turn out. Reaching out to young people. Uh, building bridges across lines of ecclesiology and ideology and politics. Um, this is really important work, more important now than ever in a, uh, in a broken church in a divided country. And who it's named for. I, uh, I came to know uh, Cardinal Bernadine first as a bishop, as a boss, as a leader, as a teacher. <laughs> 
And then as an Archbishop and a Cardinal, I never called him Joe. Uh, he was always uh, a pastor uh, to me. And he very much shaped my work. As I look at my vocation as a layman working for the church, the emphasis on that faith should enrich public life, that uh, standing up for human life and human dignity is the call of the church. Collaboration, working together. Catholic definition of collaboration is an unnatural act between partially consenting adults. <laughs> and we need more of that. Uh, he taught us to bring people in instead of pushing them away. And there are really two kinds of leadership. Uh, if you think we've lost to the culture, then you hunker down. You try and preserve and protect. You judge and you condemn. If you think we have in Catholic social teaching, in the gospel, what we need, then you engage and persuade. Cardinal Bernadine was an engage and persuade kind of leader. Pope Francis is an engage and persuade kind of leader. And the mission of Catholic Common Ground is to engage and persuade. This honor comes to me at a tough time. Michael referenced the fact that uh, I, at one of our dialogues and in the pages of America, talked about my 50 years of experience with Catholic, with the clerical sexual abuse crisis. And for the first time talked about what happened to me as a high school seminarian beginning at 14. And in some ways, uh, the worst part of that was working directly with four cardinals who have uh, left their positions because of what they did and did not do in very different ways. I found that in some ways uh, more crushing. So it's been in some ways a disorienting, even demoralizing time to go through this. I, I wrote the piece was uh, what I learned from 50 years of clerical sexual abuse. But tonight, there's a different story. It's what I've learned from 50 years of being a lay person working for this church in the service of our social teaching. It has been an amazing blessing. I have seen people in this country and around the world standing up for human life and dignity that would make you proud to be a Catholic. People sheltered every night. Young people would get an education. At Georgetown and here at this great place, people learning how faith touches the world. So even in tough times, we are more than our failures, even though we don't evade them, even though we have to fix them, even though we need reform and renewal before we have healing. But tonight, for me at least, is a time for gratitude. Gratitude to my family, gratitude to my colleagues, gratitude that the Catholic Common Ground continues its work, gratitude for this recognition and for those who made that work possible and deep gratitude that in this time of trial, we are still called to the mission of bringing good news to the poor, liberty to captives, new sight to the blind, and to set the downtrodden free. I am deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Steve Millies. I'm a member of the faculty and the director of the Bernadine Center here at CTU. Uh, and this is the first opportunity I've had uh, to speak at one of these common ground gatherings. So let me s continue to sound a note of gratitude, uh, not only that we have the opportunity to do this. When I applied for this job, uh, and spoke from a lectern very much like this. One of the things that I said, and I continue to think it's true, 
is that the Common Ground Initiative is the beating heart of the Bernadine Center because everything we do comes back to dialogue, comes back to realizing that our relationships with one another, both within the church and our, the relationship of the church to the world, uh, that's the center of what Cardinal Bernadine's life and ministry were about. So this is very important to me. I'm grateful to be able to be here with you as I'm grateful to be able to follow uh, John Carr and thank him for his service and his courage, uh, the long time that he has spent working on behalf of those who need your service and your courage. Thank you very much. This is a, a special thing for me too, I have to confess. Uh, nearer to 25 years ago than I would like to tell you, uh, I was a second year master's student TAing my first class. It was uh, Steve Schneck's Introduction to Politics at Catholic University in Washington. And uh, from among the bright-eyed faces in that sophomore level survey class emerged, among others, a Minnesota attorney who held elected office in his 20s and remains a bright legal and political mind, and I just learned a great father. Uh, a priest involved in youth ministry for many years, a vice president of the Heritage Foundation, and someone else that I want to talk to all of you about who is here tonight. For me, that class was a remarkable experience, less for anything having to do with what happened in the classroom than for the relationships it has enabled me to maintain with smart people who've gone on to do interesting, important things. It was lightning in a bottle, and I'm glad it happened. I've searched my memory for the insightful comments that I wrote on reaction papers to Rousseau or something like that, uh, something that would have inspired so many people to do so many great things, and I want to assure you I have found none. So there's no credit for me to take at all, and probably we should say I was barely treading water as a brand new TA. I don't present myself as an important character in this story, I am a witness. One of the important things I witnessed came several years later after we all had left Catholic U, when one of those former students unfriended me on Facebook after we had disagreed about a matter of church discipline. And I should say that our disagreement was just that, it was disagreement. No name calling, no invective. The reaction was totally out of proportion. Brian was the first to write to me shocked that it had happened, that a long relationship could be disrupted by a simple disagreement over something in the church. I was grateful to Brian for writing to me about that. I certainly knew then that our speaker tonight understands common ground, is committed to common ground, gives personal witness to common ground. And by the way, that other fellow and I eventually refriended and everything turned out fine. But as I've suggested already, Brian studied philosophy and political theory as an undergraduate at Catholic U before he went on to study systematics at Boston College. He joined the faculty at Marymount University in 2009 where he teaches ecclesiology and ecumenism and where he's cultivated an interest in Jewish Catholic dialogue. He's the author of several articles in ecclesiology, the Toronto Journal of Theology, Theological Studies, the Anglican Theological Review, as well as in more popularly read places like America. He's an active contributor to the Daily Theology blog, a past officer of the College Theology Society, an organization I never tire of joking that I feel too old to join. His dissertation was published in 2011, Communion, Diversity, and Salvation, the Contribution of Jean-Marie Teilhard to Systematic Theology, and more recently, he's published Stumbling in Holiness, Sin and Sanctity in the Church. Listen to a few words from it. A mistaken theology of holiness that conflated holiness with inerrancy in all matters practical and theological compounded the sexual abuse crisis. Fear of scandal that would mar the perfect image of the Holy Mother Church or the spotless bride of Christ led bishops to close cases or reassign abusing clergy quietly and without transparency valuing the unsullied image of the church and a brittle conception of holiness more than the safety of minors or the needs of victims. Stumbling in Holiness is a book that paints the picture of a church that is complex, 
a communion not only of many local and particular churches around the world held together by a bond of unity, but a communion of the saints across time who together pray for and with one another in holiness and in sinful repentance. And if it's not clear, that's a church in conversation with itself. It's a church in dialogue. All of which is why we've invited him here to be with us tonight to offer the 2019 Monsignor Philip Murnian Lecture, Dialogue in a Humbled Church. Please join me in welcoming our lecturer and my good friend, Professor Brian, Fr Professor Brian Flanagan. Thank you. I'm quite honored to be here in the company of so many friends and colleagues and new friends and colleagues. I'm happy to say after previous lecturers who were cardinals and bishops and eminent theologians, the Catholic Common Ground Initiative seems to already be embracing my proposals for a smaller, humbler way of being church by inviting me tonight to give this lecture. What about standards indeed? I want to join in honoring my colleague across the river in DC, John Carr, for all of his work on behalf of the complicated church that we love. I want to thank Father Michael Place, the chair of the Catholic Crown and Ground Initiative and its advisory board for this invitation, the organizers, especially Dr. Steve Millies, and Peter Cunningham of the Bernard Center for Theology and Ministry here at the Catholic Theological Union, Nelson Simchi, who has been doing all sorts of work keeping me on time and in the right place and on the right flights, as well as Carmen and our, our leaders in prayer and all the other people who have made this possible. And finally, thank you for being here in person or virtually, for caring enough about Common Ground in our church to spend a Friday evening thinking about it with me. My friends have assured me that listening to me talk for 45 minutes is an appropriate penitential practice for a Friday in Lent, though, so you'll get credit for this. We Catholics in the United States in 2019 live already in a humbled church, a humiliated church even. The etymological roots the same for both. At one level, we share in the same process of humbling of most organized institutions in our country over the past 50 years, a loss of social prestige in the face of secularization, a loss of institutional strength due to declining numbers of clergy and practitioners a loss of political power, particularly in places like Chicago or my native New England, where the voice of the church was a major component of public life. But more particularly in the past 20 years, and again, especially in the past year, we have learned more and more about the sinful failures of our church in relation to the abuse of children. Our church failed thousands of children and young adults in our duty to protect them from sexual and physical abuse. Our leaders, both clerical and lay, committed and abetted this abuse and compounded its impact upon survivors through denial, intimidation, and minimization. And our leaders, both clerical and lay, hid this truth from the wider church community, from civil authorities, and from the general public. We dare not forget this part of our history, the dangerous memory of where a lack of ecclesial humility can lead. And if, as I plan to do, we ask I, tonight how we might learn and grow and reform from this experience, we dare not present it fastly as a silver lining. There are lessons about what the church is that we could have learned another way, that we should have learned another way, that I wish we had learned in some other way than on the backs of thousands of innocent victims. Any growth, any purification that comes from this moment is due to God's grace to draw some good even out of great evil. But we dare not forget the tragic cost of abuse to victims, to their families, to our communities, even if their suffering seems now to have provided the stimulus for reform and renewal in our church. And yet, this humbling, this humiliating experience is teaching us yet again that we are a holy and a sinful church dependent upon God for any good that we do and always open to further failure until the full coming of the reign of God. My title this evening is Dialogue in a Humbled Church. And let me begin by giving you a bit of a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about and how in our time together. 
First, I'm going to outline some of the ways in which we can think about the church being small, being poor, being dependent, to open up some space to think about ecclesial humility as a virtue. Second, I'll outline a theology of ecclesial humility, starting from some of the ways we think about humility as a general Christian virtue, and then exploring three ways in which that humility can function in the heart of our church's life. And at the heart of that theology are the practices of dialogue, exactly the kinds of dialogue that Cardinal Burden and that Monsignor Murnian and that the Catholic Common Ground Initiative have worked to foster, promote, and encourage in our church. And third and finally, I want to look briefly at some of the recent history that led to our re-forgetting of this truth. I want to ask what we can learn about ecclesial humility from our current experience and where we go from here. Before that, three caveats. Canonically, you're not allowed to give a theology lecture with at least some caveats, and also these days you cannot give a theology lecture without mentioning Pope Francis. <laughs> Two notes about the word church. I'm speaking this evening primarily as a Catholic theologian to a primarily Catholic audience, and so when I use the word church, I'm primarily thinking of my own Roman Catholic church, and more particularly of the church in the United States with all the gifts and limitations of our particular viewpoint and my particular viewpoint. But especially with regard to the ecclesiological underpinnings, what I have to say I think is potentially of value to the entire Christian church, that is to the divided body of Christ found throughout our various churches. The scandal of our division provides one more reason for ecclesial humility, and so while I, will be speak, while I will be speaking within a particular community of the body of Christ, I intend my thoughts to be possibly relevant to all Christians. And second, when I say church, I'm not referring primarily to ecclesial leaders, to the pope and bishops, to clergy. I'm referring to the church as the congregation of the faithful, the entire assembly of the baptized, which includes our clergy, but is not limited to them. As I say to my undergraduates, the church's preferred pronouns are we, us, are, not they, them, there. And finally, I'll be speaking throughout this talk about ecclesial humility, poverty, kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ and of the church. But like most important theological concepts, these ideas, because powerful, are dangerous in the wrong hands. Feminist theologians, among many other liberation theologians, have pointed out how the concepts of humility, self-emptying, sacrifice, have often been used by the powerful to further push down the powerless, or to push them to embrace their suffering or their lack of power as though it were willed by God. Some victims of sexual abuse in particular were shamelessly told to keep silent about, of their, about their abuse because of a false ideal of humility. My hope is that the theology of ecclesial humility I'm outlining here will avoid that ideological trap and promote a vision of humility as a form of Christ-like power, but from the outset we should be aware and cautious in using these concepts. So part one of the church as small or humble, there are a number of different ways in which we can begin to talk about the smallness of the church, a cluster of terms and metaphors that might help us to point to the quality of the church I'm trying to draw out here. They all describe not only the reality of the church, but the reality of its Christ-likeness. And so point us back to the church's imitation of Christ and continuing of Christ's mission through the power of the Spirit. So the first one, a poor church. In one of his first audiences after election, in explaining his choice of name, Pope Francis, I told you it was coming, told reporters about Claudio Umes's advice to the conclave, in the conclave, don't forget the poor. Francis told reporters, come vorrei una chiesa povera e per i poveri. How I would love a church that is poor and for the poor. In this, in his image of, and also in his image of the church as a field hospital, Francis has presented a vision of what Stan Shu Ilo has named a poor and merciful church. In doing this, Francis points us back to John 23rd's vision of the council and to liberation theologians who drew upon its teaching, to the pact of the catacombs at the end of the council, to help the church become ever more a poor church with and for the poor. At the first level, this primarily points to a poor church in the sense of material poverty, one that shares in the lives of the vast majority of Christians and the vast majority of humans who struggle for their basic means and struggle for their basic dignity. But in addition, not a replacement, but in addition, 
I want us to think about the greater poverty of spirit that might also be called for, a church that has nothing of its own and that relies upon God for its life, for its identity, for its existence. In this, the poor church mirrors the poor Christ, born to a poor family in a Galilean village, living on the margins between dominant cultures and empires, and easily divested of his few possessions at the cross. The poverty of the church, particularly among those who follow the evangelical councils, has always been seen as an imitation of the poverty of Christ, who took on the form of a slave, and the poverty of the Holy Spirit, who has no hands but ours, no words but ours. A second way is to think about the weakness of the church. The language of power in weakness or of weak thought as opposed to the dominance of strong thought has been used by, by postmodern philosophers like Johnny Vattimo to address the limitations of human thought and the danger of ideological power as determinations of thought. In theology, theologians like John Caputo have written about the weakness of God. That is about God's refusal to force God's self upon us and God's willingness to be at the mercy of creation, at the mercy of our relative freedom. A weak church then, or at least a church that looks weak in comparison to the ideals of power we find in much of our world, is another way of getting at this quality. We can look at the example of Christ who fought against the powers of the world with his words and with his self-giving rather than with an army of angels. Or the power and weakness of the Holy Spirit who inspires us to use our freedom rather than overcoming that freedom and possessing us. A third way, particularly appropriate for us here at the Catholic Theological Union with its Franciscan heritage, is that of a small church. Small doesn't mean numerically small here. I'm not talking about a holy remnant or a Benedict option that gives up a whole swath of our mission or a whole swath, gives up on a whole swath of our culture. Rather, by a small church, I'm thinking of the Franciscan emphasis upon gods and our minoritas, our minority, our smallness. As with their poverty, Francis and Claire and their spiritual descendants point us towards the God who asks us to become like little children to become fratres minores, little brothers and sisters to each other, in imitation of a God who became little for our sake and whose Holy Spirit arrives sometimes as a rushing wind, but more often as a still, small whisper. A fourth way is to think about the church as the pilgrim people of God, and that requires some unpacking, because for most of us, not all of us, but for many of us living in North America in 2019, Pilgrimage makes us think of traveling on a bus with father, with the hardships of some lumpy beds and some strange foods at times. It's more like a traveling retreat. Then the medieval experience of pilgrimage in which outside of your community, your kinship group, your support structures, everything that made you safe, you were on your own, on the road, depending upon the charity of strangers and the fellow pilgrims and on God. So in this, I want to follow, follow uh, Peter Fawn, who asks us to think, instead of the pilgrim people of God, the migrant people of God, the refugee people of God. That points to the church's utter lack of safety, utter lack of security outside the care of God. In this, the church becomes migrants like the Holy Family was, refugees like the escaped Israelites were, pilgrims who can stumble, lose their way, get robbed, and who, like the Son of Man, have no place to lay their head. A fifth and final introductory analogy for understanding the church is to look at it as a self-emptying church, a church that imitates the kenosis, or self-emptying of Christ, who in the famous hymn quoted in Paul's letter to the Philippians, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. A church that empties itself in fidelity to its mission, that holds nothing back for its own security except its trust in God, is another way of imagining what the church should be. Though again, as feminist theologians, including my, my Marymount colleague, Annie Selick, have pointed out, this idea is particularly dangerous if understood poorly as an encouraging already vulnerable people, especially women, to further sacrifice their own self-worth in relationship to powerful others. But the idea of emptying oneself of all that is not God, 
so as to claim one's mission as a child of God, as Jesus did, seems to be a crucial aspect of the Paschal mystery. A canonic church, a church whose mission to the world defines its identity, rather than holding anything back in preservation of that identity, it's another way of getting at this idea of humility I'm trying to make space for tonight. So to bring all these ideas together, I want to point to the classic virtue of humility, which has been more often applied to individual Christians rather than to the church community as a whole. And in doing so, I'm drawing on a few sources, but one you'll hear me referring to a lot is a one remarkable book by Father Michael Casey, a Trappist monk of Tarawara Abbey in Australia, which is just fun to say, entitled A Guide to Living in the Truth, St. Benedict's Teaching on Humility. It's not surprising that we can turn to a Benedictine source for thinking about humility since our religious communities, our Benedictines, our Franciscans, all of the constituent communities here at the CTU, or even the Jesuits, have often been the, the laboratories of spiritual life for our church. Workshops where strategies for baptized living have been developed and beta tested. Laboratories where the experiment of living according to the reign of God have been attempted over the centuries. Remember that you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. It's Friday in Lent. The etymological origins of our word humility give some clue as to how we can think about it. It and its Latin predecessors come from the word humus, meaning dirt or earth, the same word from which we get the word human. The same way that Hebrew talks about the Adam, the earthling, made out of the Adama, the dirt. Humility is no more popular now in 2019 than it was in the Greco-Roman world. Remember, I live in Washington, DC, which might be an interesting indication of how pagan our world has become. But part of that unpopularity is a, through a misunderstanding of humility as a kind of weakness of personality. Humility is equivalent to shyness or to a certain cloying smallness or spiritual mousiness. Encouraging that kind of humility is precisely the sort of things that keeps people in their place, keeps lay people paying, praying, and obeying, keeps clergy quiet in the face of mismanagement or injustice. So if we reject that kind of false humility, what do we put in its place? Humility is about truth. It's the virtue of living according to the truth that we are humans and therefore come from humus that we are creatures and therefore that we are not God, that we are limited and fallible and potentially sinful, and all that not only in relationship to God but in relation to our fellow humans and our fellow creatures. Humility, Casey writes, citing Bernard of Clairvaux, is grounded on truth within oneself and one's relations with others and with regard to God. In such a perspective, humility connotes a fundamental concordance with the reality of our nature. And despite humility can be the very opposite of reticence or fear. Being true to one's nature might be recognizing one's limitations. Being true to one's nature might mean speaking the truth of one's value, the truth of one's story, worth, dignity, in relation to God and to others. In Casey's exploration, pride, the opposite of humility, is primarily a symptom of fear. Fear for one's security or identity that leads us to grasp for an artificial identity, an idealized self, a mask that will make us look better to God, to self, or to others, instead of a self that is a gift from God. He writes, humility is the opposite of any kind of artificiality, role playing, good manners, or seemliness. Humility means setting aside the mask. It is a kind of nakedness that allows us to be seen without the bulwarks of social conventions. We present ourselves to others transparently in all our imperfection and vulnerability. We depend on their goodwill for acceptance and love not on the success of our efforts at self-promotion. Similarly, Kent Dunningham, Dunnington in an essay on humility in Augustine defines humility as a disposition of the will to embrace radical dependence, particularly with respect to one's self-identity. And given that humility is a habit of truth-telling about oneself and learning to act in accordance with that truth, humility is not a one-off accomplishment, 
but a lifelong task of conversion, of being and becoming humble, small, poor, weak. Not in relation to the powers of the world, which sometimes needs standing up against, but in relationship to God, so as to confront the powers that oppress us within and without. So if, and it's a big if, if this account of the virtue of humility is adequate, how can we apply this more explicitly and robustly to the church? What does a humble church look like? It's noteworthy that much of what I have to say is echoed in the foundational ideas and documents of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. My attempt here is not to replace that, but to give some additional ecclesiological foundation for the practices of dialogue they're already promoting. If humility is the definitive virtue of our Christian life, as one scholar suggests, then dialogue is its key practice, its key habit. So the obvious place to start is with the cultivation of humility among each of the baptized, including its leaders, that sort of more traditional view of individual humility. But I want to pull back to the level of the church as a whole. How can we talk about the entire community as being humble? How is humility an unspoken but crucial mark of the church, right up there with unity, apostolicity, holiness, and Catholicity? The first place is in our relationships within and between communities. And here it seems to me that the Common Ground Initiative's commitment to dialogue is evidence for its implicit theology of a humble church. First place is humility between Catholics in sometimes polarized groups or theological preferences within the United States. To quote from the Common Ground Initiative's principles of dialogue, we should recognize that no single group or viewpoint in the church has a complete monopoly on the truth. That we should not envision ourselves or any part of the church as a saving remnant. That we pre should presume that those with whom we differ are acting in good faith. All of this is a, in, rooted in the kind of Christian intellectual and practical humility that speaks the truth about the limitations of our viewpoints and of our membership in a wider community, as well as the humble truth that we all have something to contribute to the life and knowledge of the church. This includes the usual suspects, for example, the white male theologian with the Irish surname, as well as the communities that struggle to be heard in our church including our Latinx majorities in the United States, other non-Euro-American Catholic experiences, LGBTQ Catholics, and the Society of St. Pius X Catholics. Sharing our views without listening to those of others indicates a lack of true humility. But in the broader theology I'm advancing here, so is thinking that what we have to say is not worth hearing or sharing. Beyond that intra-Catholic conversation, Dialogue in a humble or humbled church is not limited to conversation with fellow Catholics. The language of dialogue that John O'Malley points to as constitutive of the Second Vatican Council was most often deployed in the council in relation to other Christian churches, to other religious believers, to non-religious people, to the public and social sphere taken as a whole. O'Malley's summary of Vatican II's change in style, especially in relationship to those outside of the Catholic Church, is a litany of the qualities of a humble church, from commands to invitations, from laws to ideals, from threats to persuasion, from coercion to conscience, from monologue to conversation, from ruling to serving. Only a humble church can enter into dialogue, not as a superior, but as a dialogue partner. Only a humble church whose humility is rooted in truth, that believes it has something to say, can enter that dialogue while maintaining its real commitments and authentic fidelity. So dialogue, I would argue, is the key practice of humility, the kind of activity we're doing tonight, but also the kind of activity when Catholics of different views come together in good faith, when Christians of different churches work for ecclesial unity, when we as church enter into real dialogue with other religious traditions and with the public square, all of this is rooted in and supportive of the humility of the church. The truth telling that says that we are not God and do not have all the answers, but that we also have a story to tell and a truth to share about who we are and what God has done for us in our world. Vatican II therefore set into motion at least one major aspect that I think is crucial for a humble church. But I want to expand further backwards to look at at least two more aspects of a humble church 
that I don't think Vatican II was quite ready to address. If humility is grounded in truth and true knowledge of ourselves, then another aspect of ecclesial humility is the ability to speak clearly and authentically about the limitations, failures, and sin of the church. Not all of the failures of the church are sinful. The church, guided by God, is made up of us. Humans who, even when redeemed, are limited in our abilities, our understanding, our energy, our responses. Some of what we experience is missing in the church, or times when the church has failed to live up to its ideals can be attributed simply to those limitations of being human without necessarily being sinful. When we didn't have the knowledge that might have helped us understand something better, to preach a sermon better, to give a theology lecture better, or when we did not have the energy or the ability to comfort somebody in need. Failure to be perfect is not necessarily to be sinful, it's to be human. But much of my work in the book that Steve mentioned also was to argue that an adequate ecclesiology must always include discussion of both the church's holiness and its sinfulness. If humility involves speaking the truth about who we are in relationship to God and others, then ecclesial humility will necessitate confession, repentance, lament, and reparation of our church's sin. Our ecclesiology, especially in the past two centuries, has increasingly denied the irreducible humanity of the church, taking refuge in an abstract ideal of a church that does sin, not sin even if its members do, or in other ways distancing ecclesial sin from the real church. A humble church speaks the truth about both its gifts and its faults, its glories, and its sinfulness. Listen once more to Father Casey's advice to the individual Christian, but apply it to the church as a whole. The truth is that we are not divine, and so we cannot be expected to perform as gods. The first thrust of humility is to inculcate in us an acceptance that we are of the earth, we are humus. To judge ourselves or others from any other perspective is false and will eventually become destructive. While always guided by the Holy Spirit and indefectibly called to its destiny in the reign of God, there is no guarantee that the church's pilgrimage through history will be without stumbling, wandering, or error. This also leads to dialogue, in that no dialogue succeeds without truth-telling. Particularly in relation to the sins of our past, our conversation partners within and without the church will only trust our sincerity if we are willing to be honest about that past and name what we did and what we failed to do in relation to the abuse of children, but also in the relation to our treatment of the Jewish people, to our failures in relation to other Christian communities, and countless other stories that are part of our collective history that we could name. Finally, I want to push these ideas to one step further. With a caveat, I'm not quite sure where this goes yet. I want to think about humility in terms of where the church receives claims and is willing to give up its very identity as a community. So we're in the paradoxical world of all these topsy-turvy scale of values of the gospel, that the first will be last and the last will be first, that God has acted to bring kings down from their thrones and to lift up the lowly, that those who lose their lives will save them, but those who save their lives will lose them. What does it mean for the church to lose its life? In his reflections, Kent Dunnington pushes the concept of humility beyond the limitations that make us dependent upon God as a creature or creator, beyond the questions of sin and grace, to what he calls identity dependence. Identity dependence, he writes, names the fact that not only our existence and not only our failure or success in doing good, but also somehow our very identities are dependent upon God in such a way that the, quote, natural drive to fashion, stabilize, or protect an indelible, secure, and self-sufficient identity turns out to be a sham, which is to say turns out in a deeper sense to be unnatural, close quote. This mirrors whole swaths of theological anthropology about our being given ourself, given our identity as beloved children of God, and needing the humility to accept that gift rather than grasp at our false idols of secure identity. But what happens when we apply this to the church? We're beginning to talk about the church that has its identity as a community that is in some ways like every other human community, but in some ways not like other human communities. 
One way forward, I think, is to draw a contrast between the kinds of group identity we find in all of our human communities, and even in the church, and the kind of the community the church sometimes is and is called to be. And to do that, I'm, I'm drawing on the work of James Allison and Grant Kaplan and their readings on the scholar René Girard. Their reading on Girard gets us to a deeper level of understanding the church as a community that from the perspective of normal, quote unquote, human existence, doesn't look like a community, doesn't seem to have a stable or secure identity, doesn't seem to have any power. Girard's theory, and this is a really bare bones summary, talks about the creation and strengthening of human community. In his theory of, of mimetic desire, a recurring feature of human culture is the violent conflict that arises when members of a community learn to desire the same limited goods. And if that conflict is not to tear a community apart, the violence is often transferred onto a third person, a scapegoat who is in some way ostracized, marginalized, or even killed in a way that restores the cohesion and solidarity of the group. And it's relatively complex, but even if you're suspicious of the whole Girardian thing, you can think of that same dynamic in some of your own experience. As a teacher, when one student in the class becomes the class clown or the know-it-all, or the, the person that everyone in the class bonds against in order to get identity. Sometimes it's the teacher. In a social setting where one person just isn't the right fit. In our public media, where we love to feel better about ourselves by blaming and shaming somebody else. In our national politics, where we define ourselves over and against the people that we aren't. Girard's theory points to the fact that most of our communities and their identity and solidarity are rooted in this kind of social violence. Their sacred identity depends upon both the competitive response to shared desire and the mechanisms we have evolved to prevent our mutual destruction that lead to communities that, as good as they are, always have hidden dangerous memories of competition and violence at their foundation. What Allison and Kaplan have done is to analyze the Jewish and Christian stories of God and of God's action in the world and to explore Jesus' words and actions as pointing the way to a non-competitive, received identity of the self based upon the gift of God rather than upon our own competition. And then we can start looking at the church, the Christian community, as a community founded in Christ's words and actions as a community of non-competitive, non-rivalrous relations in which identity is given rather than grasped at, received as gift rather than earned. But like a Christian individual identity, looking at the outside, by comparison to the earned identity gained in titles, achievements, and rivalry, there's a deep paradox of a community that, by what we've come to expect as normal, is a kind of uncommunity or non-community. The church is meant to be the kind of community in which our sin, our habits of self and mutual harm, our habits of group identity and that is rooted in exclusion are slowly being replaced with a new healed social identity. We don't get saved just as individuals, we get our social life gets saved. From the outside and from our normal way of looking at things, that community looks like it's always on the verge of falling entirely apart precisely because its identity is so different than what we are used to. So I think we end up with a church whose very identity is based not upon human striving, not upon the usual identity of clear and policed boundaries, clear sacredness, clear outsiders and insiders. At the furthest end, it looks a bit like the scene at Shusaku Endo's silence at the end of the novel, spoiler alert, in which Father Rodriguez enters more deeply into the following of Christ by seeming to betray Christ and his Christian identity when he steps on the fumia. That's frightening because it's an identity guaranteed not by the strength of our institutions, the size of our endowments, the number of seminarians in training or lay people involved in parish ministries. It's guaranteed by God and it looks very fragile and weak and small and humble. But as your colleague here at CTU, Dan Haran, wrote, this requires that we confront the church's Holy Spirit atheism, 
that tends to cling to our securities and identities and implicitly acts as though Christ's ascension into heaven was never quite followed by the descent of the Spirit. So that, I would say, is the widest horizon of humility and where I think we need to set our sights if we really want to think about a humble church. So to remind you of these three aspects of ecclesial humility, humility is awareness of our limitations in relationship to God and in relation to other communities, humility of awareness of the church itself as a limited community, really open to the freedom of history and so really open to the possibility of sin that freedom involves, and finally, humility is a constituent element of a new kind of community and identity that looks and feels in the process of dying and rising to new life like an uncommunity or a community that's losing in the same way that Christ lost on the cross. All of these forms of humility can be found renewed and strengthened through dialogue. More so, all of these forms of humility can only be found through dialogue which makes dialogue, whether in the forms the Catholic Common Ground Initiative promotes or in other forms of synodality that em embody Christian decision making, makes dialogue a fundamental Christian practice that embodies this fundamental ecclesial mark of humility. For the remainder of my talk, for this third section, I'd like to step back from that fun world of ecclesiological theory to think more in the shorter term in relationship to the crisis of confidence in the Catholic Church in the United States, in relationship to the sexual abuse of minors, in relationship to the ideals and goals of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative. First, we have to start with the reality that we have always lived out ecclesial humility with mixed results all through our church's history so far. It's not a surprise that so many of the movements for reform within the church and so many of these experiments, these laboratories of religious life, early monasticism, the Cluniac reforms, the apostolic movements that led to the Franciscans and Dominicans, the Brothers of the Common Life, the new religious orders in the 19th century, all of them were trying to return to a felt and perceived loss of a small and humble church. There's also a particular story to be told about the loss of humility of the past two centuries, particularly in Europe and North America recent history and theology terms. If a lack of humility is often rooted in fear, fear for the future, fear of a loss of identity, fear of not being found adequate in the eyes of outside observers, then we can explain some of the idealization of the church of the past two centuries with respect to the losses and changes of modernity. In the long 19th century, this was especially true in times and places where Catholics found themselves or felt themselves to be powerless. In some cases, such as Germany, England, Ireland, the United States, Catholics were a relatively oppressed or marginalized group with a numerically or politically dominant Protestant culture. And others, such as Republican France or post-unification Italy, Catholics and especially bishops and clergy, found themselves marginalized in the very places where they had been at the top of society for centuries. One aspect of a counter-reaction of fear for identity, for security, was ultramontanism, over the mountains-ism, in which Catholics began to look directly to the Pope as a source of authority, as a bulwark against modernity, as a support for minority or disempowered Catholic populations, and as a focus of popular devotion. Unless we think of this as a top-down imposition, ultramontanism was very much a popular movement, even a youth movement at first, of younger clergy reacting against the supposed compromises of their predecessors. And a, and a popular movement of Catholics around the world hanging newly available lithographs of Pope Pius IX in their homes. That's all new in the 19th century. This culminated in the def definitions of papal primacy at the First Vatican Council. And while the council fathers themselves carefully detailed the limits of papal teaching authority, the penumbra of infallibility, what Yves Congar famously named creeping infallibility, began to attach to more and more papal documents, statements, <laughs> even occasional remarks at times. But it wasn't only a question of the papacy. Throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century, Catholicism 
we find not only Congar's creeping infallibility, but what we could term with apologies, trickle down infallibility. <laughs> Habits of respect and veneration for ecclesial leaders from the Pope on down to one's local pastor by which clergy and sometimes religious were located in the Catholic imagination in a place beyond doubt, question, or disobedience. In a world marked by change, by insecurity, fear, powerlessness, whether that of my Euro-American ancestors who had migrated to a strange new country, or that of a pope who had just lost all of his temporal power, the claiming of ecclesial power and the lack of an ecclesiology of humility begins to bit a, make a bit more sense. There are many, many reasons for the crisis of confidence in our church in the year 2019, and there are many, many factors that contributed to the sexual abuse of children by clergy in our church. And incidentally, they attempt to find one single causal factor in isolation from conversation with the wider church is yet another example, I think, of this lack of humility. But in my opinion, one of the contributing factors of our current crisis and of the sexual abuse of thousands of children was and is a false theology of the church unable to name ecclesial limitation or ecclesial sin. Whether in the particular cases of abuse in which a priest was always to be obeyed or trusted more than the voice of a victim, or in habits of silence and mendacity that prevented abuse from being addressed promptly and transparently, a lack of ecclesial humility compounded the evil actions of individual clergy. We were not humble, and now we have been humbled, humiliated even, by what we have done and what we have failed to do, what we have done and what was done on our behalf. As I've said elsewhere, the denial and, or covering up of abuse and the silencing of victims and their families often occur out of a desire to prevent scandal and to preserve a false theology of ecclesial holiness as perfection. Our inability to speak clearly and candidly about ecclesial sin was not the only or even the primary cause of the abuse crisis, but it compounded the abuse of children and young adults in its attempts to preserve a facade of perfection and purity. And that facade not only hid the horror of clerical sexual abuse, in its recent collapse, it has come crashing down upon the faith of numerous Catholics in their church. A humble church, a humiliated church that does not begin to address not only the practical solutions, not only the reforms needed, and all of those need to be talked about, but our understanding of the church and what it is and how we think about it in relationship to sin and grace, that needs to be a part of our continuing conversations in our church. So I'd be a, a bad speaker on dialogue if I didn't leave time for dialogue. So let me conclude with just a few thoughts about where we are today in 2019. Our current crisis might be a moment of grace for our church. Now, as I said at the outset, this isn't a silver lining to the abuse of thousands of children. This is a grace offered to us by a God who's able to draw some good out of great evil. It's not a teaching moment. It wasn't worth it. But if we are going to learn from it, then the dangerous memories, the stories and experiences of survivors of clerical sexual abuse and of their families and of their friends need to be at the front and center of our work. And with that caution, one thing we might learn from their suffering and from the searing experience it might be that we finally learn to recognize the limitations and even sinfulness of our church and create ecclesiologies and structures that take the phenomena of ecclesial limitation and sin as part of the church's reality as it moves in freedom through history rather than as a surprising or shocking anomaly. That's not to deny its holiness or its potential for holiness. It's a whole other lecture or you can buy the book. But ecclesiologies that neglect the humanity of the church, and even more so the presence of sin and sinners as part of the church's reality and history until it reaches its fullness in the kingdom of God, are not adequate to what the church is. We are God's migrant people who stumble in our holiness, whose future and identity can be found only by trusting in God. 
To do this, we need dialogue and the kinds of dialogue that the Catholic Common Ground Initiative has promoted, both for the practical reason that only through dialogue will complex responses to a complex situation will they come about, rather than these one-sided, this is the problem, if we fix this, it'll fix everything. But more importantly, this might be a moment of grace for our church in which we recognize that dialogue, especially forms of dialogue currently lacking between differing Catholics of goodwill or between Catholics who are ordained and not ordained, is not an optional add-on, but the way we live out our life together as church. I still have faith in that church's ability to proclaim the good news of the reign of God and with the power of the Holy Spirit to make Christ present through word, through sacrament, through action. But my faith is in a humble church and the holy, humble Christians I know who are fully aware of their own humanity and that of their church. And so are bringing to birth a new, old, renewed way of being church rooted in dialogue and rooted in shared common ground. Thank you. church, uh, then when you started talking about how does the humble church look like, you said if, if humility is the central virtue, dialogue is the key practice. Mm -hmm. And that made me think that truly, truly, like silence has been the key practice, like not dialogue. Like if I think of truly spiritual life, how religious congregations have operated, uh, how the church has managed, it hasn't been through dialogue. Mm -hmm. And then you made me think when you talked about Vatican II, and the openness to dialogue with other religions, other Christians, science, etc. I'm like, when did we learn to talk with ourselves? <laughs> I don't know if we skipped that period. Or I'm not seeing it, so if you could talk on that. That's an excellent question. So one part of that, I would think, Vatican II in some ways was an interesting anomaly. And I think we can compare it perhaps to the Synod on Youth that just happened, the Synod on the Family that happened before that, of wonderful ways of sharing information and sharing viewpoints as church that are possible, but that right now are only being used at sort of the highest possible letters, levels. And if we really are going to have synodality, if we really want to make the church a community in which we are actually mutually learning from each other under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so think, Council of Jerusalem and Acts, then we need not just these high-level discussions like the event of Vatican II where a lot of bishops finally learned they could talk to each other and not simply receive orders, or not just like the experience of worldwide synods, but more and more ways that the church at local levels, whether we're talking about parishes or talking about um, dioceses, regions, nations, uh, Australia is having a plenary council we could do that, but we need habits of, we, we freak out a little bit because we say, well, it's that because it's light towards democracy, right? But the, the, there's a great foundation for thinking that the church is supposed to be respecting the views and what each baptized member brings to it. Um, to go back to Benedict and Father Casey, the, the rule of St. Benedict says that um, you are to consult all of the members of the community, including the youngest, because sometimes, because they see it says, more often God speaks through those who are young. So we have right now a great theory of how we could be doing this, and that's my job, but I think if we leave it at a great theory, if it doesn't turn into actual practices and structures, then, then we miss something. So how do we bring sort of that sense of dialogue, this is Steve's job, how do we bring some of these practices of dialogue to the levels where it actually impacts people's communal life? Thank you. I wonder if there is a step between humility, the attitude of humility, and the 
discipline of dialogue, especially when a great harm has been done to those who have been voiceless. I wonder if before dialogue there is, there is a holy silence where those who have taken up the space for dialogue just listen and give more weight to the dialogue from those who have not had that space. Because I think moving to dialogue immediately from that sense of humility and that sense of truth and humility where not only we empty ourselves but we also lift up what we have to say as a church before we can lift up what we have to say we have to hear um, what has not been said from those voices that have not been heard and so that's that's i think another level of dialogue where it's first listening like saint benedict the first word listen you're right. I mean, I, I think I, I, I would still argue that we can see, not putting a second step in, but to look about, look at the way that individual humility, the humility of individual believers or members of a dialogue or conversation, how that is going to be lived out is going to change from person to person. So the humility of somebody who has spent most of their life speaking might be to let go of that speaking role. The humility, and I recognize the irony of being up here speaking as I'm saying that. The humility of somebody who's not been listened to is to, to say that I am a child of God, I had this thing happen to me, or I, even when we're talking beyond the, the issue of sexual abuse, I have a voice that needs to be heard and to be truthful is to bring that with full confidence and trust that God wants me to bring this to the conversation. So what it looks like in particular conversations especially is going to involve different postures, um, different times in which we, in which some of us are more talkative and some of us are more silent, but especially I want to stick with you of privileging the voices, the stories, I'm stealing from Metz, the dangerous memories of what has not been heard to make sure that those stories are fully heard. Um, of the 19th century and the growth of Ultimontanism and infallibility and how it's affected the modern context of the church, as well as your um, vision for a church of dialogue and humility in the future. Um, if you were to pick one of the centuries that we've gone through, one of the 20, um, which century, because at points in your lecture you identify that this is an older way or this church of dialogue is from the past. Uh, what century would you identify that has achieved that in terms of its dialogue either internally or in its relationship to the um, society or the political context? This is gonna sound like a very flip answer, and it is, but it's intended to be helpful. We haven't yet, if I, I pick the 21st, the 24th century, <laughs> or, or the, the 30th century. And, and here's what I mean by that. I, mean, I think we, we can find um, places within the church um, if we look at some of the ways in which the early church operated, but they weren't perfect either. We can look at some of the ways in which we find life in religious communities or in societies in particular times and places where this, where this worked out. And like, we can talk more about particular things. But I don't think as a church we've gotten there yet. It's only been 2,000 years. And I think that's the, the, the reason I, I'm sort of flippantly saying the, the 26th century is when we'll have that working out well, is that I th I'm stealing this, I forget the name of the person I stole this from, but the, the we're the early church. We tend to think, I, if you read a lot of sci-fi, you start thinking in more fun time frames, or if you read a lot of geology, you start remembering, and if you think that this is the beginnings of a potentially 30, 40,000 year project, then we're the Council of Jerusalem trying to figure out how to do this still. That's both a challenge but a gift, but I, I think you're, we can't look back to a golden age on this, but I think we can look to some of the principles that come from the way we've, 
been taught to live out communal life and are realizing more and more as we're freeing ourselves, say, from the idea that Christianity should be directly allied with the nation state. We're freeing ourselves from the idea that Christianity should be, right now, invites survivors of clerical sexual abuse to not be invited in at the last minute to be helping to construct what that those forms of liturgical memory and lament would look like. 